you can get down to uh, understanding uh, an application of historical materialism to prehistory. Um, this is a subject, I would say, which is not dealt with uh, very frequently, um, but nevertheless has important uh, lessons for us, uh, as I said, confirms really uh, the ideas of uh, historical materialism applied to this epoch. Um, in order to understand uh, this subject, uh, the origins of the family, and we could add private property and the state, because they're all interlinked in many re respects, then obviously you have to deal with a lot of, um, or cast aside a lot of prejudices which have been built up um, over a long period of time about our view of the past. Um, I know uh, perhaps some of us, have, oh, I think there was a film as well about uh, the Flintstones. I think everybody's seen Flintstones. You can see everybody smiling, they all enjoyed it, uh, which is kind of a very, uh, very humorous uh, portrayal of uh, Stone Age life, uh, but seen through the eyes of, uh, of a modern context where you have the, uh, the Fred Flintstone and his uh, wife uh, Betty and uh, Barney and, uh, what else was it? Come on, Eddie. Fred, Wilbur, come on, first test you failed. Um, we have got this kind of nuclear family living in this uh, stone house and they've got stone television and stone car and uh, they've got police, you know, and uh, money and uh, they got all the trappings, if you like, of, of capitalism imposed on the old Stone Age and it's quite very funny, very humorous. Um, but there has been a genuine attempt to, uh, uh, in one form or another, uh, underline an idea that in some way the things that we have now have always existed in one form or another. Maybe in a primitive form, but really what we have now is a continuation of the past. Um, this is even brought up in relation to the market economy, which is, uh, seems it's always been there, which is not the case, but this, this idea uh, it, uh, pervades uh, society that in some way all the things we have now existed before. And Clearly, the, the writings of uh, Engels, this, this book, The Origins of the Family, Private Property in the State, um, which has been uh, probably his, his most well known uh, book because of the subject matter, um, was based, as you probably are aware, on the uh, writings of an anthropologist, an American anthropologist, of um, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan. Lewis Henry Morgan. Um, uh, developed his ideas about prehistory in the environment of the discovery of Darwin's ideas of evolution. And you could say that Morgan's view of anthropology was coloured by this new conception. In other words, you have to look at things historically in their development um, he was not the only one, actually, in, in England, there was a man named Taylor, who was one of the early uh, founders <coughs> of British anthropology, who also had a similar view, uh, that we had to look at things from an historical point of view, from an evolutionary point of view, um, and you could say a materialist point of view. And uh, uh, when Karl Marx was given a copy of... Uh, uh, Morgan's book, Ancient uh, Society, he was uh, quite taken by it. He was uh, quite, uh, no, well, it, 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 he was excited by it. In fact, he, he wrote out long, long passages of this book because he could see in it an attempt uh, to look at things in a correct way, in a dialectical way, in a materialist way, and thereby really um, uh, establish the genuine evolution of early man, I say man, man and, man and women, human society. Um, I think that uh, you're also aware, it has been mentioned in the last session we had on philosophy, of a book that Frederick Engels uh, wrote, or rather an essay that Engels wrote, The um, Run of Labour and the Transition from Ape to Man, which was written in 1877. Um, and went against the whole scientific grain of the time. 
when he came forward with the view that, um, unlike the established science, that uh, the early human beings had small brains, they stood upright, it was in the process of their struggle for existence, of labour, that uh, they changed themselves and developed the human brain itself. Um, and this was a revolutionary uh, view at the time, because everybody thought, uh, as Darwin, that uh, people had developed large brains first of all, and intelligence, and other things then followed from that. And uh, they were wrong, that Engels was right, and the whole of anthropology, paleontology, and science now understands that the Engels was correct. And uh, what we have to understand, or have, the question we raise is, well, why was Engels correct in 1877? All that, all that, well, you know, period of long ago. And the reason for that was the method in which he was looking at history and prehistory, and even the origins of humankind. In other words, he was looking from a dialectical, historical <coughs> point of view, um, and rather than looking at it with preconceived ideas, like to pi picture together the way in which um, humans began to evolve from apes and what were the qualitative stages in that particular development and how the brain was affected by the material conditions of people struggling to survive, in other words, uh, hunting, <coughs> gathering, labour. Labour is the key uh, aspect which created men. This is not a, a unique um, idea now. In fact, you had uh, uh, Gordon Child, who was a, a well-known anthropologist uh, in the middle of the 20th century, wrote a series of books um, confirming this particular point of view. Um, and also the historical record now, or the, the record of, of uh, paleontology, also uh, confirms that particular uh, the correctness of uh, Engels. In fact, it was none other than uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote a series of books. His first book was called Ever Since Darwin, and it was a compilation of uh, essays, and one of those essays was about Engels. And uh, he says to his reader, you may be surprised, I'm referring to Frederick Engels, in relation to this particular question, and explains that he was uh, one of the original thinkers way back in the uh, 1870s, who explained the processes of how humanity developed, and particularly the relationship of the hand and the brain and the bipedal uh, character of early humans, or pre-humans for that uh, matter. And uh, as was mentioned in the last session, uh, one of the breakthroughs uh, was the discovery of, of a particular skeleton in uh, Africa, in southern Africa, whose name became uh, known as Lucy, who was, uh, I think, over three million, three and a half million years ago, a very small uh, human creature, uh, if you like, uh, uh, one of our early ancestors, not a direct ancestor, but an early ancestor, uh, in the transition from ape to man. And the early characteristics of this Lucy, not only were very small, but a small brain, but nevertheless walked upright. There are many theories on why um, uh, our ancestors, or early ancestors, or ape ancestors, took to bite bipedalism. Uh, the usual uh, explanation is climatic change, which forced them onto the savannas of uh, Africa and, before, and uh, adopted this posture. Um, and clearly, the upright posture enabled the hands to be free, which is the revolution. <coughs> And with the hands being free, and the um, characteristic of the hand, of the fingers and the thumb being uh, in opposition, if you like, allowing grasping, uh, this, dialectical, this dialectical interaction between the hands, the brain, the eye, even the physical uh, posture of the individuals began to change. You had the development uh, in the direction of humanity with labour. Is labour means not only an individual taking part in uh, making uh, tools, which was obviously a key aspect of humans, no other animal, other animals scavenge for food, 
Whereas uh, human beings are able to produce their means of life, which is a fundamental turning point. And obviously tools are the means by which they're able to do this. So the manufacture of tools was part and parcel of the development of humanity. With tools came cooperation. With cooperation came language. And this began the, the, the process of the development of the early humans itself. We know that there are uh, just a small uh, difference in terms of DNA between chimpanzees and humans. You're talking about 80, or sorry, 98% the same as chimps, 2% difference. But that 2% difference is a qualitative 2%. It's not just a, uh, a numerical figure, it's a qualitative difference which uh, serves to indicate the transformation from one species to uh, another. Although the origins, obviously, of humankind um, take, take part through a series of stages where you have um, uh, the uh, earliest known linkages, if you like, of three, four million years ago, some even go further back, um, of the Australopithecus Africanus, as they were known, um, which, which Lucy is part of, this kind of um, lineage this early bipedal development, which is crucial to human beings. It was related in the last session, which is entirely true. You can have a, di have a discussion in and of itself in relation to this particular subject, where the upright posture meant also that the uh, changes in the birth canal, the question of uh, hum the human brain being far larger as, <laughs> as, as humans developed, and therefore made it impossible to give birth to a fully rounded out developed brain, so the child's brain was very small, and after birth, you, it uh, increased in volume by perhaps three times the size um, over, over the years. So that shows, again, how uh, it takes a long time as well for human children to be nurtured and developed, as opposed to other animals. It takes quite a long time. Those who are parents uh, are in the audience will probably nod, yes, they're all nodding there. Oh, uh, how to bring up children is, is a, an arduous task. It takes a lot of effort, time, and uh, is quite a protracted uh, uh, process by which to pass on and, and, develop, and allow that individual to be self-sustaining, if you like. Uh, whereas in the animal, uh, with the rest of the animal world is far faster, far quicker. And one of the fundamental reasons is that we don't pass on necessarily instincts, although instincts exist, but also we pass on culture. We have to pass on the knowledge of the past in order to equip the next generation uh, for, for, for life. And uh, that is an accumulation which is handed down through speech, mainly, first of all. Only much later does it uh, give rise to uh, written uh, uh, language. Um, so you have this development. Um, before you have Homo sapiens, a whole series of linkages um, that uh, comprise this tree, if you like, whereby some went out of existence, some went extinct, like Neanderthal, like uh, um, Homo erectus, and a number of others. And now we're left with um, Homo homo sapiens, which came into existence around about 200,000 years ago. So we are quite an early, uh, or, you know, late, a late developer, if you like, a product of uh, quite considerable evolutionary development over that period of time. Um, and this early development of humans um, give rise to a, a certain form of society. And uh, this is based, as uh, Engels explained, or historical materialism also explains, that society is based upon the, the, your economy and how you work, how you survive, how you take society forward. And uh, for hundreds of thousands, for millions you could say of years, that the basis of uh, human survival was hunter-gathering. And uh, that was the essential ingredient for probably 98% also of 
human existence on the planet. So it's a, it's a very, very protracted period of uh, human existence, um, giving rise to um, a society which was characterized by uh, Henry Morgan as savagery. He um, explained that there were different phases, even in prehistory. Uh, we have to look at it historically. And he labeled three certain phases of our existence, which was accepted by um, Engels and also accepted by um, other anthropologists. And that is uh, the earliest period being savagery. This was then followed by a very short, relatively short period called barbarism. And that was followed by civilization. And the, and the different classifications are important insofar as the first longest periods of savagery, uh, which could be in archaeological terms the Old Stone Age, New Stone Age period, a Paleolithic period, um, that was again characterized by uh, no private property, no family, uh, no state, and was an egalitarian form of society. Um, and the reasoning for that was it's the only way it could survive. Uh, barbarism becomes a, a stage, and you're talking about, what, 8,000 years ago, not very long ago, with the emergence of barbarism in the form of um, stable communities being created based upon uh, rearing of stock and of agriculture. And you have the development of urban life. That's the development of barbarism. And within that, you have the development quite quickly of private property. And with that, you have uh, the emergence of civilization, as uh, Morgan described it, and what Marx would say as the emergence of class society under those circumstances emerge. And that emerges with the ability of human beings to create a surplus uh, above their basic needs in society. Um, for the vast bulk of human existence, we live from basically hand to mouth, as the gatherers. There was no material basis there for um, classes because there was no surplus created by society. And only when you have create, uh, your society is able to create a surplus is it possible to use that surplus to allow a class or caste to exist which does not have to work and can specialize in other things. So that's a, and it's a very important leap for humanity. And these are the sort of uh, dividing lines that uh, uh, Morgan set out and uh, were accepted by uh, Engels and Marx. As I said, it was Marx who first came across Morgan's book. It is available, it's, it's, it's still quite fascinating uh, in its broad sweep, in its uh, kind of perspective on, on history. Uh, Marxism has been defined as the long view of history, which I think is quite an apt description. You know, uh, we see things in, in terms of, of trends, of developments, of societies which emerge and which decline. The whole historical materialism is based on this view. That is why there's been an enormous onslaught against Morgan, Taylor, Engels, and these ideas of Marx. Because if you accept the idea that there is stages in history, that there's an evolution in history, <coughs> then obviously uh, we've reached a certain stage and there will be another stage after us which we understand will be based on the destruction of private property and the emergence of common ownership which uh, was described by uh, Engels as um, a higher stage of society but having in common with the lower stage of society uh, common ownership of the means of production. 
and an egalitarian form of society as well. Um, these early stages, Marx, Engels, Morgan uh, also came in, or there's mainly Marx and Engels, described this as primitive communism. This phase where 98% of our existence on this planet, we were primitive communists insofar as there was no private property. There was an egalitarianism between uh, men and women, between individuals in the tribal societies that existed, even where they elected tribal chiefs. These were not seen as um, posts that had privileges. They were responsibilities, but they were seen in an egalitarian fashion, because that's the only way, the only way you could cooperate. And if you haven't got cooperation, and you have competition, then you would destroy the humanity. And although you have today these views that uh, competition is all important, competition is in our nature, and so on and so forth, on the contrary, the, whole, the, the only way humanity can develop is on the basis of cooperation, which is a vital component. Because without the cooperation, uh, in these early bands, then they, would just, they, would, they wouldn't last. Obviously, human beings are very uh, limited in relation to other animals. I mean, you have uh, animals which have various, like uh, lions and tigers, which, have, which are, are, are very fast. They've got strong jaws, they have claws. You have other animals which have fur and keep them warm. Uh, human beings have not. not. We, have, uh, we have the naked, well, one, one person has the naked ape, although the book was uh, rubbish. Nevertheless, what I'm getting at is that we are very uh, defenseless creatures, really. And we have to band together, we have to cooperate in order to survive. Of course, on the basis of our labour, we're able to produce things which are extra to ourselves, which are beneficial to us. Clothing, warm clothing. We haven't got fur, but we've got warm clothing, which we produce and allow humans then to travel much further to the two colder climates and survive in colder climates. We produce tools, we can produce weapons, we produce fire. We have all these certain these things then are used to the benefit of us beginning to conquer nature yeah, and uh, control nature in our particular interest. That's what differentiates us from other animals, if you like, because of, the, of our, our, our ability to think, our ability to cooperate and our ability to engage in common labour for our own common ends. And this was extremely important for the survival and development of our human beings. In fact, we become human through labour. We become human through cooperation. And this is not just our, not a Marxist terminology, even anthropologists uh, uh, have adopted the same view as well, like Richard Leakey, for instance, who on the basis of, of an analysis of the Klang uh, uh, tribes in southern Africa understood that it was the basis of their survival and development was cooperation, of an equality. And what Mo Morgan did, that the um, various, uh, that various information he was able to gather through his particular knowledge of the uh, North American Native American, uh, North American Indians, we lived with the Iroquois, the League of the Iroquois, and he, gave it, and he, he got together, through government help, uh, a census of all the different uh, Indian tribes, co com compiling this particular evidence, and which illustrated another feature, that they were, uh, that women, rather than being oppressed as under capitalism, were held in high esteem. And this information began to come out in different uh, uh, discoveries in different areas of the world. Of course, we have to understand that when, at the present time, there, even, there exists uh, tribes which are living in, if you want to call it, uh, Stone Age times. And uh, you have advanced economies, we have an uneven uh, development of history. Even looking around the planet, it's uneven but combined development of history, and there are reasons. In fact, I was reading, not read, I, I was listening to an audio book. I didn't read it, um, of uh, uh, an individual 
whose name is Janet Diamond, who's uh, got a very, very interesting uh, uh, book. Uh, I think it was called uh, Guns, Germs and Steel. It could be in that order or not, I can't remember exactly. Um, who asked the question, why is it that there are, there are certain uh, people who are at a, certain, a lower level and so other, others are on a higher level of social existence in the, in the world? Why is it that the Western Europeans conquered Latin America? And why didn't the Latin Americans conquer Western Europe? These quite, uh, quite fascinating uh, questions. And in order to illuminate uh, why there are differences in uh, uh, different uh, uh, groupings in the, in the world. And not because people are in less intelligent, that was discounted. Um, in fact, even those who, are, who exist on a hunter-gatherer form of society are far better equipped and far more knowledgeable than any, other, than any of us in relation to their particular environment. Whereas we wouldn't last two minutes they would be very skillful in surviving and developing. It's not a question of intelligence. It's a question of what resources were available at a particular time which you were able to harness. Some resources were available in abundance, in others they weren't available. In other words, what animals could be domesticated and what plants could be uh, developed into sustainable food reserves. These are, 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 are not the same everywhere, and therefore there's an unequal uh, advantage or disadvantage in certain areas. We know, from our own point of view, that we um, were born as a species in Africa, and we moved out of Africa to colonize the whole of the world. Uh, and that took hundreds of thousands of years in order to develop. But the key factor then that uh, Diamond uh, suggests was the revolution which also Gordon Child indicates called the Neolithic Revolution whereby in a certain area of the world known as the uh, Fertile Crescent which is uh, Iraq, Iran, that area of the, of the, the Middle East there which uh, again were different climatic conditions than were today they were perfect for the development of uh, and also because of the, uh, the river the river uh, tributaries of the main uh, rivers at that uh, time give fert fertile ground and give special factors which allowed a blossoming of, uh, uh, of this, this revolution that took place in the development of urban uh, civilization, ur or rather urban culture, this is of, of, of barbarism, of stable communities. Now, it's sort of, since, although there was obviously in the initial stages, you combined uh, hunter gathering with a certain stability, but eventually hunter gathering uh, died out, and you have the establishment of urban, stable urban communities based on agriculture and stock breeding. Uh, that allowed population growth, it allowed surpluses to be created, um, and Diamond, quite, uh, quite I, think, I think he applied historical materialism there eh, in order to understand these questions, even about uh, of germs. It was quite an unusual thing. I didn't even think about it. Where uh, urban communities, or the beginning of early, of early uh, uh, urban communities, we we reared stock, and animals were very, very were herded together the best we could. Basically, sheep, uh, pigs, uh, others, other animals that we were able to domesticate into herds, and they spread their own particular germs to human beings because of our close contact with those herds, which we didn't have before. In fact, the animals would be living in perhaps the same environment as, as human beings. We would share the same, uh, well, all sorts of stuff <laughs> in common. And uh, we would have infected, and many of our, our early infections came from animals, um, which crossed over from animals into humans. Um, and in certain areas, like in South America, in Latin America, and Central America, where there weren't urban societies to that degree, when the conquistadors arrived in uh, uh, Latin America and Central America, they brought not only the steel, not only uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the means to subjugate the population, 
but they also brought germs as well, which exterminated large sections of the population. Even before they got there, they infected the local native inhabitants of cholera and other uh, very dangerous diseases which wiped out the populations. So it was quite a fun, uh, very interesting, very macabre, I suppose, but very interesting reasons and reasoning, materialist reasonings, behind, behind these particular uh, uh, phenomena. Of course, going back, because this subject does uh, um, go quite wide in, in many respects, I want to go back and explain why Marx was so impressed. Uh, in fact, he was so impressed, he, he showed his writings to Engels. But Engels was very busy at the time, um, writing a material on anti during and others, and he didn't actually read these writings <coughs> until after Marx's death. And when he read Marx's notes about Morgan's work, he was extremely impressed and decided to write this book on the origins of the family, private property, and the state. This is what he explains, which I think is worth reading. And this, is a, this is the preface to the first edition of the book in 1884. The following chapters constitute, in a sense, the fulfillment of a bequest. It was no less a person than Karl Marx who had planned to present the results of Morgan's researches in connection with the conclusions arrived, back, arrived at by his own, within certain limits, I might, might say our own, materialist investigation of history, and thus made clear for the first time their whole significance. For Morgan rediscovered in America, in his own way, the materialist conception of history that had been discovered by Marx 40 years ago, and in his comparison of barbarism and civilization, was led by this conception to the same conclusions in the main points as Marx had arrived at. And just as capital was for years both zealously plagiarized and persistently hushed up on the part of the official economists in Germany, so was Morgan's ancient society, his book, treated by the spokesman of prehistoric science in England. My work can offer but a meager substitute for which my departed friend was not determined to accomplish. So this was the background in which um, Engels undertook this particular study. And as I explained a little bit earlier on, not only did they see in the societies of the past by the information that came to them uh, from those still living in tribal society, although we have to also be cautious about this because as soon as they come into contact with Western society, they are also affected by Western society. Um, and what they were able to understand, a glimmer from these societies, was, was not only their egalitarianism um, and the cooperation that had to occur in order to survive, but also, I said, the equality of women and our women were held in high esteem in these particular societies, which we could regard as matrilineal or matriarchal. But we have to understand, whereas our society is patriarchal and male-dominated, it was, would be wrong to invert, if you like, things and say, yes, well, at that stage, women dominated men. That's not the case. There was an equality, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, if you like, where women were held in high esteem in society. And you see this even in a number of discoveries of, uh, in pottery or design of female goddesses and so on, fertility go goddesses, as if um, even the earth is seen in a, in a female context of giving birth, which is a, a miracle as far as the, if you like, people are concerned, this miracle, miracle of, of, of life. And in this way, um, also, uh, in primitive times, there was no family, like our, our own, where we have a husband and wife and children, or you can have a bit of an extended family. That did not exist. This was a tribal clan society based on kinship, based on, 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 uh, tri on, on, on bloodlines in the main, or that was extended uh, later on, in which they had to uh, control, if they were to make this leap, 
if humanity was to make the leap from an animal existence to a human existence, then certain things had to be put into play. Now, in relation to animals, and our nearest ancestors would be apes, but this applies also to, generally to the animal kingdom, there is competition, particularly in sex, for the male to dominate the female, to uh, gather as many females as possible around, around them, uh, in order to propagate the next generations of their species. This competition, this rivalry, uh, this, this violence, if you like, does affect uh, anim the animal world. There's no doubt about it. But what that does uh, um, go against, obviously, if you had that kind, of, that kind of environment, when you have to cooperate in order to survive, you will never build cooperation on that basis. That rivalry, uh, based on, on, on sex, could never build a cooperative uh, um, uh, basis in which we could survive. That had to be broken down. That animal instinct had to be suppressed, had to be pushed back, had to be done away with, if you like. And that was done away with in, in a whole series of taboos that were imposed on society, not written, by, but socially imposed, that uh, sex could only take place, not randomly, but only take place within certain uh, norms between one person and another, that sex can only take place outside the kinship. In other words, that no two of the same kin could mate. And these, uh, these rules, these taboos were brought in, uh, and it's been, it's been kind of projected that this was brought in by females, which is entirely likely not by the male, by the female, who brought these taboos in to enable us to cooperate equally on equal terms and thereby abolish this uh, animal existence, if you like, or rivalry, which exists in other forms of, of the animal kingdom. So this was a, this was a big step forward. The suppression of this uh, rivalry for sex was suppressed this enabled cooperation to take place, an equality to be built up between men and women. As explained earlier, even, also, even the, 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 the growing esteem for women in this primitive, communist, uh, matriarchal society that was built up. Where, where, um, and this is the, what, what Engels explained would be the first rudimentary development of humankind itself where there was no private property, there was equality, there was cooperation. Of course, there was a division of labor, true, between men and women. And in all likelihood, it was on the basis of hunting was the preserve of men and gathering the preserve of women. Although many anthropologists today kind of uh, say, look, even then, gathering was the most important anyway. Um, and in any case, the, in addition to the clan, for instance, um, the, ma the vast majority of food was gathered through, uh, it was attained through uh, gathering itself. But in any case, it was a cooperative thing. Even if you see or take note of different hunter-gathering societies, even today, or the records that have, been, that have emerged, we have, even when hunters come back, they come back not as braggers to the community, they come back in a very humble way, they downplay what they have done. They um, come to the to the if you like to the to the tribe uh, uh, in the opposite way you have today, where people brag, if you like. And the reason being, they don't. This was a, and this was natural, not a, an imposed thing. And this is this is throughout hunter-gatherer societies. It's a natural thing not to boast, but to come in a very modest way, even if you've done very well. Um, and in that way, you cooperate with everybody else. You don't boast. You're one of the you're one of the of the tribe. You're one of the community, if you like. And that's a very important social understanding in order to um, bind together the community itself. <coughs> and uh, uh, obviously, uh, the produce was shared out in an egalitarian manner. And you had, if you like, a sustainable. Uh, unit, tribal unit, based on this primitive, 
communist matriarchal line of development. Of course, this goes against everything that the bourgeois anthropologists uh, have believed. They, they have come for they've evolved various uh, um, ideas. You know, man the hunter, the violence of the early early society, and so on was part. It was, was something was had, which was which was uh, put forward before, and now they treat anthropology not as an historical subject to look at things in long uh, historical terms of evolution, but all they do is attempt to collect and to compare different cultures that exist in 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 hunter gatherer societies without drawing out any real lessons of historical evolution. In other words, one hunter-gatherer society is as good as another, you know, they've got differences, but it doesn't make any fundability. In other words, it doesn't answer the puzzle of what was humanity like before. And uh, um, above all, they've po poured scorn of the idea of a matriarchy. A matriarchy only arises from the idea, which is quite a, a, an easy idea to grasp, in these primitive communist societies, uh, even when you had sex, you don't know. The father would not know the offspring. The offspring would only know their mother. But in these primitive societies also, they had a different view of um, the mother and uh, of relations. Because all the females in the tribe were seen as mothers. All the children in the tribe were seen as their children. In other words, it was a, a, it was a social thing. Social production social uh, view of life and social um, relations were built up in this, uh, e in this particular epoch. And therefore, uh, matriarchal, matrilineal um, uh, linkage, linkage uh, arises from the fact that in these societies only the woman only the, would, would know who their children were which was obviously an important aspect of building up their particular esteem in society at that stage. Now, the danger, obviously, in modern anthropology, you have different schools of thought then who have become anti-evolution. You've got the structuralists, the functionalists, and the diffusionists. Apart from the postmodernists, you've probably got to add, who see these things, see, do not attempt an, an evolution historical view of society, but just look at things uh, individually, comparing individual things, but not drawing historical conclusions from their analysis. And they have rejected the idea of, of, co of primitive communism, they've rejected the idea of matriarchy. All these basic concepts have been thrown out of the window. I'd just like to quote one uh, anthropologist, Leslie A. White, who commented about the present condition of anthropology when she said that in addition to being anti-materialist, they are anti-intellectual, anti-philosophic, uh, regarding theorizing with contempt, and anti-evolutionist. It has been their mission to demonstrate that there are no laws of significance in uh, ethnology, that there are no rhyme, no reason in cultural phenomena. That civilization is, in the words of R. H. Lowy, a foremost exponent of this philosophy, a mere planless hodgepodge, a chaotic jumble. I mean, that's the kind of uh, ideas that current anthropology have. In the words, it's, it's very bits and pieces that you can't make a sense of it really. You compare one and the other, but it has no theme has no rational evolution. Whereas Marxism understands that anthropology, paleontology, the development of human society or life or the planet, all has a history, has an evolution, which we have to grasp with and understand. And we also, also give it, we give it rhyme and reason by explaining the material basis for societies, how they arise and how they decline. Not only prehistory, but also post history as well. In the last, since class civilization has existed, even they've been divided between slavery, feudalism, capitalism, which are all forms of class society, come, which came into being on the basis of the development of a surplus that accrued in barbar or, or, under barbarism. 
And this surplus transformed things. It allowed a section of society, maybe starting with the priests, or a greater division of labor, which allowed a specialization, and eventually the development of classes in society, whereby one section of society would be freed from human labor and would live on the labor of others, whether it be serf labor, whether it be slave labor, or it be wage labor. That is the product of class society itself. But with the development of class society, obviously you have the emergence of the interests of class society, which is private property. Private property emerges, becomes the ownership of a, a privileged class in society. They therefore require a guardian of that privileged position, and that becomes the state itself. The state emerges as a guardian of the privileged classes in society. So it's, it's in other words, classes come into being historically at a certain juncture, at a certain time, when the material conditions also allowed. With that, you have the emergence of the state at that particular time because of private property, and you have the emergence of what we know today as the family at that time, which then became a patriarchal <coughs> form of society, male-dominated society, where the males who had the uh, ownership of property, wanted to hand down their uh, property to their uh, offspring, and the only way that could be done was on the basis of a patriarchal lineage of the, of the domination of the male and the uh, marriage uh, uh, on that particular basis. So therefore you can see the link in, if you like, of these things to economics, uh, social development, and, uh, and, 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 and historical development itself. In that way, Morgan certainly blazed the trail in relation to anthropology, and Engels was able to give it a, give it a clear, if you like, or clearer um, def defining analysis, rooting it in the development of historical materialism. However, we should say that uh, what Engels wrote in, uh, in The Origins of the Family, Private Property of the State in 1844 uh, is not set in stone, but can also be changed and modified on the basis of new evidence that can be developed and that can be discovered in one form or another. That's why he says in his preface to the fourth edition written in 1891, seven years have elapsed since the first edition appeared. And during this period, our knowledge of the or original forms of the family have made important progress. Uh, it was therefore necessary, digital, diligently, to apply the hand to the work of amplification and improvement, particularly in view of the fact that the proposed stereotyping of the present text will, further, will make further changes on my part impossible for some time. In other words, we are introducing modifications here yeah, based on new historical facts that have come into, into, into being. I have therefore submitted the whole text to a careful revision and have made a number of additions in which I hope due regard has been paid to the current state of science. In other words, what Engels is doing is outlining a broad picture uh, it's filled in a lot of the details, but it does not mean to say that every single detail that Morgan came up with or Engels came up with will stand the test of time on the basis of new historical research. But broadly speaking, that the evidence that have, has come out since the, uh, uh, the foundation of the origins of uh, the family private property in the state have generally served to confirm those particular ideas and themes. Of course, there is no, this is prehistory we're talking about. There's nothing written down. You won't see any books on it. There's no evidence in that, in that sense. We have to piece together like a jigsaw what primitive society was like on the basis of a whole number of sciences. But I would say on the basis of the evidence of anthropology, <coughs> of paleontology, of zoology, you do come very, very close to this thesis of Morgan and also of Engels 
in this particular matter and confirms really that Marx was correct. That you can even look, even in 1877, where there wasn't much, there was, Lucy wasn't around, there wasn't any discoveries around, and yet Engels was able to come forward and give a proper scientific explanation of the development of humanity, which went against the rule of science at that particular time. And he was able to do that by the method of Marxism, to understand if it allows you to, to get, at least put you on the right road, <coughs> gives you an I, the idea where to look. Of course, you have to, you have to look and discover yourself, but the basic ideas can be seen in that particular way. So we would defend this idea that the vast majority of humankind lived under primitive communism, where there was no classes, where there was an egalitarian system, there was no private property, no state, no oppression, and particularly held women in esteem. Because that broke down. That form of society, that, that tribal society, could not uh, last because of the emergence of private property itself and the development of classes. Now we have reached a time in history whereby class society has reached its limits. And class society itself is threatening to throw us back. And only on the basis of the elimination of private ownership, only on the basis of a socially planned economy, will we be able to restore humanity to its rightful place in the sense of equality, fraternity, <coughs> where the sexes have equality, where we all, as a human race, are able to raise our sights in relation to the future and our prospects. That's what we are doing. We are retying, if you like, the, hot, the knot of history. We are on the road, if you like, of building on the humanity, the millions of years that humans and, and, and pre-humans have been on this planet. The next stage is the abolition of class society and the restoration of the basic ideas of primitive communism, but on a far, far higher scale, where we have the material basis now to, 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 to introduce genuine equality, where we can introduce genuine freedom on that basis of, of elimination of the scarcities and the production of a superabundance for the human race itself. Therefore, I think that this book, The Origin of the Family, Private Property of the State, is a, is a classic should be studied by all colleagues, not only for the, the, what's in it, but the <coughs> method that, we're, that, that the analysis was right at, which is dialectical materialism, is the application of this method, this world outlook, to this particular free history of our race. But nevertheless, it's also an important guide to the future. Thank you. First of all, uh, the point was made about uh, this idea that in some way our nature is basically uh, you know, uh, based on the, the nature of the jungle, you know, that that's the real nature of people. You know, we're very deep down, we have this uh, animal consciousness, if you like. And uh, I think that, that point uh, was made to Engels, and he had a bit of a laugh over it and said, well, yes, that's exactly the animal is exactly what corresponds to capitalism, is it? But not the real human relationships. It's capitalism that's created this competition, rivalry, and all this, this that goes with it. That's the kind of law of the jungle. And uh, in reality, it's not uh, real human nature. It's the nature of capitalism. Um, in, re in relation to a number of the other points which you raised, at least the questions, I'll try and answer some of them. Was one uh, question was, well, what are the differences between these different stages of uh, savagery, barbarism, civilization? You also asked what kind of books should be available. Well, there's, there's a very good one called uh, What Happened in History by Gordon Child. And that deals uh, really with the uh, emergence of barbarism uh, and the, the, what he termed the Neolithic period and also the revolution in that period. It's a decisive time, that's when the surpluses are created. This is where classes begin to be formed. This is where you have stable communities, you know, based on agriculture and stock breeding, uh, which is a decisive time. It's Dennis, because in, in my opinion, it's like a, more or less a Marxist view 
of, of the period, and he's an extremely well, you know, renowned uh, uh, archaeologist. So that's your best. Man makes himself was an earlier book he wrote, which again is extremely good. Uh, and by the title, it gives you an idea of what it's talking about. It's uh, <coughs> man makes himself through labour, and that's Engels' uh, um, thesis, and that's what uh, Gordon Chow uh, elaborates on in a much more richer way. Obviously, Child is an archaeologist, and he's got, I mean, the whole book is full of facts, figures, arguments, illustrations, which are fascinating, uh, and obviously well worth reading, because that, that, that supplies you with the real meat of the context. All I'm giving you, if it, it was the broad brush, if you like, in a kind of talk. You can't go into that kind of detail. Um, <coughs> but it's also on page 30, you see, he goes, to, the story begins, 500,000 years ago, or maybe 250,000, he wasn't even sure uh, exactly when Homo sapiens evolved. And this says that um, it was a, uh, a gathering economy corresponding to what Ma uh, Morgan termed savagery, uh, provided the sole um, source of livelihood op open to any human society during nearly 98% of humanity's sojourn on the planet throughout the whole of what archaeologists describe as the Neolithic, rather, or Old Stone Age. Uh, so because there is the, so it's a hunter-gatherer form of society, is the vast bulk of it. Then it goes on to say that 8,000 years ago, so it's not that long, you're talking about um, a period opening up, the Neolithic or the New Stone Age, as he says, which is barbarism, where you have um, the new food-producing economy. In other words, rather than gathering, rather than hunting, you're actually now producing. That's the fundamental feature, which means the, the st uh, st basically domestication of animals begin at this stage, and uh, agriculture begins at this particular stage. So that's the, a decisive turning point. And later on in the uh, Neolithic, you have this uh, development, this revolution that takes place and opens the way up for civilization and the development of classes. He talks about um, uh, uh, we talk about barbers, he talks about the alluvial valleys of the Nile and the Tigris Euphrates, uh, and the Indus uh, and the riverside valleys of the cities. And this is the beginnings of civilization and the Bronze Age. Uh, the Bronze Age gives rise to social surplus derived primarily from subsistent agriculture by irrigation was concentrated in the hands of a relatively, relatively narrow circle of priests and officials. Um, Marx, I don't want to go into it because it's a, lot, <laughs> a subject in and of itself, the idea of um, uh, the, uh, a different stage that emerged, but it wasn't class uh, society. Um, where you had uh, more caste relations, like in Egypt, for instance, and the development of Egyptian society based on irrigation and these huge irrigation pro uh, projects that had to involve uh, large sections of the population who weren't slaves, but nevertheless felt bound, duty bound, to new I think, castes which were developed in the society, the priest caste, even kings and so on and so forth, which were managed to get the surplus created by the, uh, the peasantry itself. They lived off the surplus and uh, they were the, their talents were to use for the building of these huge uh, uh, irrigation projects and so on and so forth. <laughs> well, obviously you wouldn't put up by the uh, Egyptians. Um, <laughs> <laughs> certain other things which this, uh, uh, this author relates is the Neolithic barbarism, which is, again, is the, is the high point of, of um, or the higher stages of barbarism. Um, and he explains that among men, uh, among them, while men hunted, women, we must suppose, had collected, among other edibles, the seeds of wild grasses, ancestral to our wheat and barley. The decisive step was uh, deliberately to sow such seeds on suitable soil and cultivate the sown land by weeding and other measures. This was the first step of the Neolithic Revolution. He actually says it's probably women who began this revolution because in, the, in addition to gathering, you, gather, you, you, 
gathering is a very skilled thing. You know, it's not a question of you know the skill is in hunting. Obviously, there is a skill in hunt, hunt, hunting. There's a knowledge in hunting, uh, and, and allows uh, us to understand far far greater you know the habits of animals and how, how they they live, how they 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 uh, they, they uh, uh, are, how you're able to capture them and so on and so forth. Whereas um, uh, in relation to gathering, gathering and crops and finding out the different seeds and what berries were edible and not edible and so on, again, it was a, a very, very important um, branch of knowledge that was necessary. And it was through this, clearly, on the basis of planting some of these seeds, and they have to be, in other words, you have to have selection um, in order to find the best quality uh, seed um, in order to develop before it become worthwhile. And this was most likely the development of, of women's role in horticulture and in, 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 it, in that sense. Uh, and he does actually go on to say that uh, a change took place in agriculture whereby women were mainly involved in horticultural activity. As soon as you have the introduction of, of the uh, oxen and, and greater means of production, women's own is squeezed out and they became monopolized by men and private property. Which again, is an interesting, I mean, it's not a kind of gradual process. Well, it is, sorry, it is a kind of gradual process where gr gradually the, the role of women, which was very <coughs> large, was, was squeezed out at each point until you had the development of uh, a greater amount of private property. And private property is, is not just. I mean, in primitive communism, you had the property owned by, it's true, individuals of hunting tools and so on and so forth, but it's not considered as private property as such. <coughs> it's the property of, of, the, uh, of the clan. It wasn't seen as a way of, of gaining extra and, and uh, becoming, you know, uh, better than the next person, on the contrary. Um, in relation to the point that was made about, well, what, how, where did I get this idea that um, uh, hunter-gatherers particularly the men who'd gone hunting, come back to the tribe um, in such uh, demeanor as they, uh, they don't boast about their particular kill. Um, I tried to find it. I'm sure it is. It's either in, well, I've seen it in a, in a number of books. I haven't been able to, to quote it, unfortunately. I could send it to you. But uh, either it's in Kutch. There's also a very interesting book called People of the Lake by Richard uh, um, Leakey and Roger Lewin, who, uh, again, are... Um, anthropologists who have gone into in some detail have tried to picture the part together if like the puzzle in all aspects of life and they also come to this idea that it's cooperation uh, that is key to the development of the sustainability of the clan and the sustainability of tribal life and I believe it's in there where they say that uh, this is the the, the attitude of hunters is not one of boasting, but of the, but the opposite. And I've seen this in a number of cases. But again, I haven't got the sources here. I'd have to send them to you, trace them and send them to you. But I'm positive that is the uh, kind of general view of um, the hunters in a return from hunting. They do so in a very um, uh, uh, humble manner than in any boastful way, which does fit into the... Uh, kind of uh, idea that you need, to, you need to, in a tribal society, there has to be this kind of um, uh, cooperation and not rivalry or boastfulness <coughs> or I'm better than you kind of scenario, which can obviously lead to great frictions, which it has done. And therefore, that's the kind of um, attitude. In other words, you have a different approach and attitude in uh, relation to one person to another in tribal conditions than you do in capitalism, for instance, and I agree with what they're saying that obviously in, uh, it's true, you can go to tribal societies today and you see all sorts of manner of uh, um, uh, uh, things that you could, you could identify, male domination, different attitudes, but they have mainly been introduced from outside and not a natural evolution of the society <coughs> itself, and that's been the, the problem, if you like, of anthropology. I must apologize, I didn't want to say that every person Every anthropologist is a, is a bit of a bastard. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to give you that idea. Um, I meant to say that the dominant um, uh, ideology, if you like, in anthropology is, a, is one of, of what I've been describing, of not an historical one. There are individuals, the exceptions, as you, you yourself um, pointed to, there are exceptions, 
who look at things from an historical point of view, are influenced by what Engels and, and uh, Morgan wrote. And they're trying to apply that and, and explain it. And that's a very valuable contribution that they're making against the main trend of anthropology, I would say, at the present time, and has been in the past, which is an attempt to do down that for ideological reasons, I believe, rather than scientific reasons. Uh, they do not want to, you know, uh, open up uh, anthropology to uh, be um, a kind of uh, 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 backing for these very subversive ideas of Marxism, as you have in, uh, you know, uh, paleontology with this uh, 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 punctuated equilibrium, which has been brought out but again. It's a very dialectical concept, but an absolutely correct concept. It's a, it's a. A correction to Darwinism. Darwinism is absolutely is correct. It's fine, as far as it goes, but uh, it, it doesn't. Darwin didn't understand fully uh, the mechanisms of evolution and believed it was a that evolution was a gradual process, and uh, uh, that's clearly not the case. That evolution is one of, of breaks of discontinuity, of revolutions, evolution, revolution, and so on and so forth. So it's not a straight line as Darwin imagined, and therefore this idea of punctuated equilibrium is more accurate in, this, in describing a dialectical process in relation to history, and we should apply that to anthropology, because that is the real, uh, that opens the door to understanding things. Even if you haven't got the full picture, it gives you an idea of where to look and how to proceed. And, 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 and that's why I think that, yes, we do defend um, uh, Engel's role in that particular regard, but it's also backed up by the evidence as well, which is coming out more and more. Um, I don't know if I got all the, all, all the stuff here, and I think I may have lost a few pages, but um, uh, well, just, it just says, I don't know, we'll go off and into a tangent, but the, it, it explains that most of the serials that we managed to uh, uh, develop came from the period of barbarism. There's very few afterwards, uh, you know, of um, uh, and in, in relation to domestication of animals, it was basically based in this period. Very few were added to later on. Uh, so there was, it was a genuine revolution. Um, it says here, to accomplish the Neolithic revolution, mankind, or rather womankind, had not only to discover suitable plants and appropriate methods for their cultivation, but has also devised special implements for tilling the soil, reaping, storing, and converting it into food. This is the role of women. And uh, they, they added to the, 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 the enormous knowledge at this particular time. But that was then cut across by the emergence of private property. I've got the, I don't know the nuts and bolts of uh, or the mechanism, the entire mechanisms, but clearly you had the development of privileged layers who became more caste, or you do, a new caste, which evolved into more of classes in society itself, with a vested interest in maintaining their own particular privilege position and their own dominant male role in society itself. And that's where you have all the other changes come about. In other words, what we're saying is that um, this, uh, the, this development of the family, just as with the state, just as with money, just as all these things happen, not because of an in innate nature, but because of historical reasons. Certain factors coming together which produce these particular results. And when these particular factors change, the results change. That's why you had the, the destruction of primitive communism and the emergence of class society. And where, we, as I've said, we've reached this, this limit of class society. What will the future classless society be like? Well, we can speculate, can't we? But we can't know what it will be like. Um, it's impossible to say exactly what it would be like, even on the basis of social relations. All we know is that the relations would be between people will be genuine relations. It will not be based on uh, uh, finance and money and economics or anything else, or power politics and so on and so forth. It's a genuine uh, uh, relationship of people this, you know, uh, coming together to live the best life that they can live. Uh, and all you can say is that would be a damn sight better than it is at the present time. We'll be burdened with everything else uh, that we can see around us. And what kind of family emerges 
Again, I do not know. It's speculative, as, as, as Engel said. We cannot decide upon what kind of relationships are going to be developed in the future. That will be the role and prerogative of the future generations to decide. But it is quite possible that, yeah, um, the monogamy will be built upon in a genuine way. Uh, but that's, again, is, is speculation. All we know is human relations will be transformed. And the uh, broken relations, if you like, under capitalism will be cast aside and you have a genuine development of relations. The family, there will be common ownership, there will be full equality, and the state itself will wither away and be an administration of things. Uh, and a cultural revolution, which we could not really dream about, will be the next thing on the agenda. So therefore it is important, I'm sorry I didn't answer all the, the points, maybe I can't. All I'd say is there are a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, books, um, which I could perhaps put up on Marxist.com and get, give a list of, it, of interesting uh, material, even the up-to-date authors, I don't know about some of them. I'm sure there are, there are a number who have added to and developed in a very, very worthwhile manner. And we need to get this information and, and put it out there because it's uh, part of our history, part of our history, uh, prehistory, part of where we come from, our origins. And that shows the breadth of Marxism, really. It touches on everything and gives an explanation of everything because it's a materialist, dialectical <coughs> explanation of uh, life uh, and our place in it. In other words, it puts everything in context, not just this particular aspect, that particular aspect. Everything is entirely linked together in a, in a, in a dialectical sense. And therefore, you know, I would say that Engels did us a, a great service together with um, Morgan in bringing, out, bringing our attention to this early period. And yes, it's part of our, our duty, if you like, to rescue it and uh, you know, to ensure the correct thing is given, if you like, or explained to uh, not just commerce but out there as well. So um, we pay our homage to uh, Morgan and to uh, Engels and we build upon their particular work in explaining prehistory and uh, which is a glimmer of what our own history is going to be like in the future. Thank you.